You know, before I begin, um, <clears throat> I don't know if you've heard that wonderful story um, about the mother who had three, had two little boys uh, who were pretty rambunctious and uh, ill-disciplined. And uh, she thought, she tried to, to discipline and nothing would work. And so she thought, well, maybe if I take my children to the minister, the minister will be able to do what I've not been able to do. And so she forewarned the minister and the day came and she took her two little, little uh, pumpkins with her and uh, left them with the, uh, with the minister. And the minister uh, had given some thought already to how he might approach the, the question of discipline. And he thought to himself, he said, you know, if I ask them a question, um, maybe uh, they'll begin to get it. And so these two little boys sat in front of them and he said, tell me, where is God? And the two little boys sat there quietly, didn't say a word. And he thought that they, would be, they were being a little obstreperous, and so he thought, well, maybe he needed to uh, raise the voice of authority. So he raised his decibels, and he said, tell me, where is God? And again, the two little boys just sat totally quietly. Again, he raised the decibels, tell me, where is God? And at that, the older boy jumped up and said, come on, Joey, let's get out of here. God's missing, and they think we did it. <laughs> But, you know, I think we gather here today and we're asking that question uh, as we face the challenges uh, that the various speakers have spoken about. Um, where is God, the God of love, the God of grace, the God of mercy? For me, it began... not with a sword, but with a gunshot. I was standing on a dirt road in Indeleni, South Africa, whole populations having fled for fear of attack, and I was standing within earshot of two very young policemen when the gunshots sounded, close enough to hear them, one of them say, Dar hetelenoha ina. There, they've got another one. I had my suspicions as to what he was talking about, and looking down into the valley to my right, I noticed a group of men walking single file from homestead to homestead, and I, began, I became worried. With my preacher's collar on, I made my way down into that valley, following, foot, following little footpaths until I came to a place where two police vans were parked. I arrived just in time to see one police van drive off, and as I watched, I saw a red stream of blood pour out from beneath the closed door onto the fertile soil that always promising life now was receiving it back. Appalled, I realized what I was witnessing, and the phrase hit squad was no longer theoretical. I found myself quite unintentionally and naively right in the middle of one, hearing the gunshots, seeing the consequences, flowing red from the cold steel of a meat wagon, dealing not in animal flesh, but in people's lives. I was horrified. I was horrified as I myself quite literally was walking through the valley of the shadow of death and desperately wishing that I could feel just a little more certain about, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. In the violence witnessed in that valley, I encountered for the first time raw evil, and it shook me to the core. And I wondered what it would take for Christians to be people of faith who say no to the way of the sword and yes to the way of the Lord. A few of us in that Indeleni situation trying to be peace monitors in a, uh, where, where, es where violence was escalating, escalating sent out the call, peace monitors needed, peace monitors needed, please come, as we feared the consequences of the growing violence. Nobody came. Nobody came. We didn't know how. We didn't know how to offer a witness that says no to the way of the sword and yes to the way of the Lord. In the violence I witnessed at Indeleni, I encountered for the first time raw evil 
and it shook me to the core. But 27 years later, it still does, and it pre preoccupies my ministry today at Covenant United Methodist Church in Spokane, Washington, as after each mass shooting, and we know the names, Sandy Hook Elementary, Columbine, and we know it doesn't stop there. But after each mass shooting that might have happened during the week before the Sunday, we pause in our worship service to add another red origami crane to the 100 plus red cranes, one for every mass shooting since 1984, hanging in one of our church towers. And as it hangs there, surrounded by 1,000 white peace cranes, we remember the dead, we pray for the wounded, we grieve with mothers and fathers, partners left behind to now live without their loved ones. Another mass shooting. It happens with such regularity. And we hang another red peace crane. And we wait. The most powerless thing about it, which is probably something that you deal with as well, the most powerless thing about it all is that we know another mass shooting and killing will soon come. And we feel like there is nothing we can do beyond prayer about it, nothing to help a nation and a world learn how to say no to the way of the sword and yes to the way of the Lord. In Spokane, Washington, as we wait for the next mass killing, as you wait too, just like in Indalani, we wish that something would come, someone would come, but we don't know how to proceed. And so the question is very much this question of how do we start locally at the grassroots level? How do the Methodists of the Indalani, around the, of the valleys around Indalani Mission Station, how do the Methodists of Spokane, how do you Methodists from your own particular geographical region, how do Christians, how do people of all faiths and beliefs, beliefs begin the deep work of cultivating a spirituality that nurtures a witness committed to nonviolence as the way of pursuing peace? I came across a moving way, and maybe the answer begins in a very simple way like praying the Lord's Prayer. I learned recently how to pray the prayer, something that we do by rote, rep repetitiously, and which we verbalize, but we really never internalize, and perhaps experience in a way which incorporates our bodies, our minds, and our souls. The First Nations, some First Nations people do it this way. Our Father, our mother, the breast, which art in heaven, hallowed mind meeting the sky, hallowed be thy name, thy holy tipi, kingdom come, thy will be done on earth the way it is in the Godhead. Give us this day, open the page of this day, our daily bread, padding the loaves. And forgive us our trespasses, that which is done under the cover of night. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation. And we avert our eyes from the direction from which temptation comes. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us. And notice they draw a sword. Deliver us from evil. And they cast the sword of violence away in the direction from which temptation comes. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever, the sun going across the sky. Amen.
And the thing that moves me so when I pray that prayer is it identifies that evil has a face, so to speak, and the face is a sword, and a sword is used for violence. And it is that evil of violence. Lead us not, lead us not, O Lord, into temptation, but deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom. And so it might simply begin with learning <clears throat> how to pray the Lord's Prayer, not just verbally, but with our bodies, with our minds, and with our souls, so that we can feel this prayer that the Messiah taught his people so many centuries ago. But what about this? A bolder step still. What if congregations offered Christianized versions of karate and judo classes? I know it's an apparent contradiction. But many of these disciplines, these martial arts disciplines, really pretend, say that the purpose is not to obliterate the, the opponent. The purpose is simply self-defense or even to win one's enemy. But in actual practice, we know that many young boys, particularly young men, as they attend these classes, have reinforced within them the desire to have a reputation on the playground, to being a kung fu master, a reputation that says, Clint Eastwood or Bruce Lee style, mess with me and I'll obliterate you. But imagine these same young boys, and note particularly that just about all of the perpetrators of the mass killings or us men. But imagine if these boys would have come into a church gymnasium just like I have in Spokane, uh, Washington. And we say to them, let's begin with the Lord's Prayer. And they would then begin to immerse themselves in the deep, deep wisdom that Jesus teaches. But then they would get to that part where they would pray, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us and they would learn to draw the sword, the evil of violence, deliver us from evil. But then we don't stop there. Having, having given them some content, a spirituality which would ground them in the way of love, we then move on to muscle memory. And we teach them sword work. Because we know that within each and every one of us, the shadow of violence lurks just beneath the surface. And we cannot pretend to believe simply to say to young men or to any people, Jesus says, turn the other cheek and expect them therefore simply to obey and never to be angry, never to, be, to lift, a, lift a, a hand against somebody again. Love your enemy. We can't expect that suddenly to be real. And so we put a sword in their hand, having just prayed, Lead us, not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. They've drawn the sword of evil, they've thrown it away, but then we put a sword in their hand. And this is a Japanese version of the samurai, a bokken, a training sword. And sheathed on the side, we say, say no, say yes to the way of the Lord. Hold it by the blade. And then we turn it over and we say, say no to the way of the sword. But then we teach them sword work. And as they learn the discipline of a warrior, as they learn the discipline not only of the warrior, but also the importance of the warrior's sword, the swordsman's stance to be centered right beneath the belly button, so they begin to understand that being a warrior requires extreme focus and extreme discipline. And we begin to suggest to them that being a warrior of nonviolence requires the same as well. And at the end of their time focusing, but as they work out, as they work out with the sword in their hand, they are dealing with that shadow side that exists within each and every one of us. And at the end of the work with the sword, 
we reverse that and once again we say say no to the way of the sword and holding it by the blade we say say yes to the way of the Lord but then we end the session in this theoretical exercise we end this we end this theoretical session by praying that Lord's Prayer or that part of the Lord's Prayer once again which whenever I pray it moves me deeply because it speaks to my heart in a very poetic deep-seated way deliver me and one can picture all the various forms of violence being held up that we commit whether it's rape which we've heard about today whether it's bigotry or racism forms of violence deliver me from evil and the swords of our lives are now framed by Trinity into a love that is stronger than death and having enacted having prayed the Lord's Prayer in a way which transports us transports us in transports us into a feeling way uh, of getting in touch with Jesus's teaching having taken the sword and confronted the shadow of violence that still lurks within each and every one of us we then place it and give it to Trinity the circle of love as Anton Rublev would describe it we surrender the darkness the evil within us to Trinity and allow Trinity to frame the swords of our lives into a love that is stronger than death swords sheathed by Trinity into a love stronger than death reveals nothing less than the power of the cross the power of a love that refuses to use the sword of violence to get its own way the power of a love that refuses to return violence for violence when attacked the power that comes from loving so much that one would rather bleed oneself than cause others to bleed the power of the cross the power of love the power to redeem and to bring life and then it's all about stories as Brian McLaren says we need to get away from prescribed philosophical beliefs but to telling the stories of grace and mercy and one such story which communicates the power of the cross is the story of Terry Roberts there's a peace crane that hangs in the Tower of Covenant United Methodist Church and of the 100 plus peace red red peace cranes surrounded by the 1,000 white peace cranes of the eight of the 100 red there is there are two that that wear a golden wreath and liturgically the golden wreath reflects the gold of Easter and resurrection but behind it is the power of the cross quoting from the Washington Post the simple quiet rural life she knew shattered on October the 2nd 2006 when her oldest son Charles Carl Roberts the fourth walked into a one-room Amish schoolhouse on a clear unseasonably warm Monday morning the 32 year old husband and father of three young children ordered the boys and adults to leave tied up the 10 little girls between the ages of 6 and 13 and shot them killing five and injuring the others before killing himself Terry Roberts's husband thought they'd have to move far away he knew what people thought of parents of mass murderers he believed they would be ostracized in their community blamed for not knowing the evil their child was capable of but in the hours after the massacre uh, uh, as Amish parents still waited in a nearby barn for word about whether their daughters had survived an Amish man named Henry arrived at the Roberts's home with a message 
The families, he said, did not see the couple as an enemy. Rather, they saw them as parents who were grieving the loss of their child too. Henry put his hand on the shoulder of Terry Roberts, Roberts's husband, and he called him a friend. The world watched in amazement as on the day of their son's funeral, nearly 30 Amish men and women, some the parents of the victims, came to the cemetery and formed a wall to block out media cameras. Parents whose daughters had died at the hand of their son approached the couple after the burial and offered condolences for their loss. But the Amish did more than forgive the couple. They embraced them as part of their community. When Roberts underwent treatment for stage four breast cancer in December, one of the girls who survived the massacre helped clean her home before she returned from the hospital. A large yellow bus arrived at her home around Christmas and Amish children piled inside to sing her Christmas carols says Terry Roberts, the forgiveness is there. There is no doubt they forgive. In the violence I witnessed at Indeleni, in the violence we experience each time there is another mass shooting here in the United States, we encounter again raw evil from which we pray to be delivered. Deliver me, deliver us from evil. I'm still wondering what it will take for us to be a people of faith who say no to the way of the sword and yes to the way of the Lord. My prayer is that covenant's humble beginnings might mature. We'll hang another peace crane every time there's another mass killing. And when we do, we'll pray again, deliver us, O Lord, from evil, longing for that day when people will be able to decide to say no to the way of the sword and yes to the way of the Lord. And as we pray, we'll be inviting the Spirit to help us trust as we learn to love like Jesus, saying no to the way of the sword, yes to the way of the Lord, that yea, though we walk through the valley of the shadow of death, we will fear no evil as we decide to say no to the way of the sword and yes to the way of the Lord. Amen.